very much. The Lord bless you. It's good to study the Word. Yeah. Hallelujah. We are, we are giving the, what we call the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, when He is come, which means a person, that He will guide you into truth and He will teach you things. And so, uh, and then the Word says that He only speaks that which He has heard in the throne room. So we know the source, you know, coming directly from the throne room and is coming through uh, the, the person of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he has gifts and fruit. Uh, he, he has, and then he has more than that, then he has, he has personnel, he has as ministers, apostles and prophets and so forth. And so he is pretty busy uh, <clears throat> handing out things to the body of Christ. Uh, that means you and, and myself and all others that love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are studying these special supernatural gifts that, that, are, that belong to the church. And I think we went... <coughs> went into Romans uh, and to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where we, we dealt with the unity of the body. If there is not perfect harmony among God's people, the Holy Spirit is grieved and He does not function. Uh, he will not function uh, if there's disunity. If, if you're going to be carnal, you cannot function in the supernatural. They just don't go together. And, and then in the next chapter, you call it chapter 13, we find that the gifts of the Spirit do not function without love. And then feeling that you may not know what love is, there's the greatest definition in the world about what love is in chapter 13. And then it continues with the gifts right through chapter 14, telling you how they function and operate in the body. It's amazing to me that... Uh, that, that so-called uh, uh, full gospel denominations, they don't study the gifts of the Spirit in their Bible schools, and, and uh, their pastors know little or nothing about the gifts of the Spirit, and then they wonder why mighty revival doesn't come upon them. If, and this new, in this New Testament dispensation, if we don't function in all the things that are, belong to us, then we cannot expect the Spirit of God to rest upon us. I was asked this week by several uh, people, and, and, and including Brother Crouch in Los Angeles on TBN, uh, uh, regarding, will there be mighty revival? You know, he was blubbering with it, really. Uh, mighty revival in America. And I said, I don't think so. How, how could this sinful place expect revival? I says, there will be places like like, 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 like Brother Rod Parsley over there, he adds about a hundred new people every Sunday to his, to his audience there. And, and there's a tremendous moving of the Spirit of the Lord there. And, and so there will be places where there will be great outpourings of His Spirit. But upon a, a nation and a church so worldly, church with adultery in it, you know, preachers and, and laity, uh, you can't expect the holiness of God to be poured out upon unholy people. And, and if you think it should be, uh, you, you read the Bible, and God, God says in one place, or several places really, uh, that even if, if Noah and Daniel and Job were all lined up in a row, all they could do would be save their own household. That would be the ultimate they could do. And the Lord Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. Noah only saved his own house. He couldn't save his neighbors. He couldn't, he couldn't save his kinfolks, you know, come, come, coming down the line from his, his father died five, five years before the flood came. But he, he, had, uh, he had 90 years or 95 years of watching it go up and we see no relationship that he had with it at all. And so if it's going to be that way as it was in Noah's day, you and I better be a Noah. And, and save our house, save as many as we possibly can. Now, uh, on page 56, we're dealing with the supernatural word of God's knowledge. We dealt in our last lesson with the supernatural word of God's wisdom and discovered that it was something that God projected in the future. It was history pre-written by God Himself. 
And that's what it is. And that it functions today. And that God wants it to function a thousand times more. And in some parts of the world, it's going to function in its total fullness because these are the last days. And now we, we have the gift of the Word of God's knowledge. Let's look at it. In the second gift of the category called Revelation Gifts, you put, put a little circle around the word Revelation Gifts, there are three revelatory gifts, and this is the second one that we, have, that we will have dealt with. Then we have one more that we will, that we will be dealing with. Um, it, it is the gift of the Word of God's knowledge. Knowledge, and, and you should underline that very strongly, as to what is knowledge? Knowledge has to do, number one, with, with truth, and it has to do with a fact. We're trying to show you that it is something that exists, is what we're trying to do here. Knowledge deals with the things as they now are, uh, not going to come. That's the word of God's wisdom. The word of God's knowledge is things that exist at the present. Therefore, with the word of knowledge is when God reveals to a person, one of his servants, something which now does exist on planet Earth, and that it's something that cannot be seen with the eye, heard with the ear, or can touch. It's something supernatural that he shows you. We will be illustrating that very quickly. And, and so this, this would be something you could, you could not know in your natural abilities. Uh, if it had to do with the mind, if it had to do with the eyesight, earsight, it would be something your eyes had not seen, your ears had not heard. Normally, it would have to do with, 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 the, with the meeting of an emergency situation. The gifts of the Spirit usually function in, you might say, crisis moments. And because that's when we move into them, that's when we want them the most, it seems. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 8, it says to another, God gave the word of his knowledge by the same Spirit. We know that God is omniscient. He knows all. He has all knowledge. I, I, God knows every person. He knows every place. And there is nothing that he does not know. So if he reveals supernaturally a word of it, not all of it, no one could contain the knowledge of God. Uh, a, a word or a portion. A word is, is part of a sentence and, and it's not the whole sentence. Uh, and so when he reveals to you a word of it, he's re revealed to you only a portion uh, called a word. And so the, 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 the word of knowledge. Let's look at it in the Old Testament first here. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. And he said, I... I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts uh, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down your altars. They have slain your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, that's what Elijah was saying, that I am left to, to seek, and they seek to take my life away. Verse 18, yet I have, God's reply to that. Uh, he says, yet, I have left me with 7,000 in Israel. What was he doing? He was giving supernaturally a word of knowledge to a man who didn't know. He, he thought he was the only one left. Now, I think it's pretty easy to feel like that if you're not careful, that you're the only one God's got left. Uh, but God might have to tell you he's got a lot of them left that you don't know about. And so he revealed to this preacher called Eli Elijah and says, I just like to tell you that I have 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to an image or to Baal and, and, and every mouth which has not kissed him. They have stayed away from false religion completely. And so we find that it worked for Elijah. God gave him a word of his knowledge that living at that moment were 7,000 he didn't know about. I guess he'd like to get acquainted after that, wouldn't he? And, and, and let's look at a, a, another one there. Uh, and it's Elisha. In 2 Kings 5 and 20, Gehazi, the servant of, of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has, has spared Naaman the Syrian, and not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I'll run after him, and I'll take somewhat of him. And, and so in verse 27, 
It says, And the leprosy thereof of Naaman shall cleave unto you and unto you to your seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. What happened here? An assistant pastor decided the pastor hadn't taken up an offering and he ought to go get it. And without asking his master, he ran after him. And then when he came back, he hid the stuff. And he said, oh, wh what you been doing? Oh, nothing. He said, didn't you know my spirit went with you? He says, you went and took Naaman's gold and his Babylonian garments and so forth. So now you can also have his leprosy free. And may it be in you and your seed ever after you until all of you will die of leprosy. I don't think we've got a comprehension of what, who God is and how easily God can be hurt when you defy him. And when you go your own way, it was only rebellion that took Adam out of the Garden of Eden. Just sheer rebellion against God. And when you rebel against God, you might think it's a small thing. This guy here thought that, that uh, he might get an advance in the, in the household. And, and that uh, Elisha might say, hey, you're clever, more clever than I thought you were. I'm going to raise your salary a little bit. He didn't. He said, you disobeyed. You did what was wrong. My spirit went with you. I know what you have done. Supernaturally, he knew exactly what he had done. And then, then he had to pay for it all. But right down below that two points is Elisha knew the enemy's war plans. This is one of the most remarkable instances of the word of God's knowledge uh, that we have. In the Old Testament, the prophet Elisha used the, the gift in a remarkable way. In 2 Kings 6, he revealed where the alien armies of Syria were, how they were coming against the king of Israel. While he was sitting in his own house, he would tell the king how the armies would attack, how they, he could confront them, and the Syrian king accused some of his intimates of treachery. But they... They assured him it was only the prophet of God who knew these things. He sat in his own house and knew where an army was and knew how to get to them and defeat them. The preacher did. So he told his own king there in the southeast corner down there tonight, they're behind those sand dunes. And at a certain hour, they're going to strike. You strike first. And, and the, the heathen king says, somebody around here is telling on me. And they said, oh, no, it's that preacher over there. He knows everything you're doing. He knows where you are. He knows how to defeat you, and you're finished. And, and, and so here was the gift of the word of knowledge. The king didn't know where the armies were. They thought they were in hiding, but they couldn't hide from a prophet that when God was saying, I'll show you a word of my divine knowledge. You don't leave the house. You don't have to go look. That's where they are, I'll tell you. Tell the king. It takes a lot of courage. What if you'd have gone out there and they hadn't been there? You see? Uh, but uh, he, he had it, and it worked. I look back up just above you there where it says Samuel and Saul. When Saul, who was a Benjamite, uh, was called to be king, he hid himself. Uh, he was so reticent and, and, and uh, humble, you might say, uh, that that he hid himself. And so they had to call upon Samuel to find out where he was because they looked for him and couldn't find him. But the prophet knew where he was. First Samuel tended to him. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. So God told him where he was hiding at. And Saul must have been really surprised. They came and pulled that bunch of junk off of him and said, Hey, come on out of there, boy. Uh, God got a job for you. Come on out of there. But here you find the, the, this gift. Now, of the nine gifts, seven of them functioned in the, New, in the Old Testament. The nine in the New Testament, tongues and interpretation, are the only two new gifts uh, that we have. Now, your next question, I'm sure, would be, how about Jesus? Did he function in these gifts? He functioned in all of the gifts. Uh, he also functioned in the word of knowledge. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus exercised a gift with great authority. For example, in John, 
uh, chapter 1, verse 47. When he saw Nathanael, he said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. This means the discerning of spirits. That is the, the, that is the third of the revelatory gifts. Uh, and he, uh, he, he saw his insights. Uh, that gift is needed in the church almost more than anything else today. We have too many people acting and they're not living. And we don't need actors, we need livers today. God wants us to live right. And if you, if you can't live right, don't wear religious garments around acting religious because then you've got two things against you, you know? You're a, you're a hypocrite and a liar and a deceiver and you're in trouble. I can guarantee you that you are in, in trouble. Uh, but uh, they said, he, he, he related that. Then, then he said, whence knowest thou me? And, he, and Jesus was said unto him, before that Philip called thee, went to see him. When thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. That had to be the day before, you see. So, so uh, he, at a distance, come to know someone and to see someone. And uh, he knew what they were when they came. He knew where they were before. He had already seen them before. Here, supernaturally, the Lord Jesus saw the man the day before sitting under a fig tree. And, and this is one of the words of knowledge that he had. In John 4, 18, Jesus tells a Samaritan woman about herself. For thou hast had five husbands, and they were total strangers. But God gave him a word of knowledge of her inside, you see. You had five husbands, and he that, that thou hast is not your husband, uh, uh, in that thou saidest is truly right. You don't have a husband. You're living in adultery right at the present time. And so he saw and understood uh, things in a supernatural way that were related, related to knowledge, to knowledge about her. And, and so it is a very, very remarkable situation. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the, the gift of the Spirit, and this one functioned very early. In Acts chapter 10, verse 19, Peter, Peter knew the three messengers uh, from Cornelius were on their way and, and would inquire of him at the gate of the house of Simon, of Simon the Tanner. He greeted them with the words, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. That, that could be some really exciting moments, couldn't it? Uh, this is the communication of God's knowledge. And so God told him they were coming. He must not refuse them. He must welcome them in. And so when they arrived, he says, I'm the one you're looking for. You see? But because God had communicated that these people were on their way. They were coming. And that when they got there, he said, I'm... I'm the one you're looking for. Let's get going here. So uh, I, I want to give you some in our own, in, in, in our own lifetime. And, and maybe we should do that in, in number eight. A, a Christian lady in, 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 in Tulsa, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, the story is very brief here. Uh, I knew her. <laughs> I ate dinner at her house in Tulsa. And I, I sat in a chair. She said, this is where it all happened, in that chair. And it says, I saw my son and his wife and two children get in the car. Now, they live clear across town. And I saw them go out to a lake to fish. I saw them let the boat in the water, put their lunch into the, into the boat, put the fishing tackle in the boat and everything. I saw them go out from land about, about 30 yards, about 30 steps. And suddenly my son reached over to do something to the, one of the little children, his children, and the boat turned over. And I saw my two, my two grandchildren die. I saw my, uh, my, I saw my son's wife die. And I saw my son die. They drowned. She called the fire department and they said, you're crazy. She called the police department and they said, you're crazy. But she was persistent because she called her son's house and there was nobody there. And she would tell them what she had seen and they wouldn't believe it. And she said, I'm going to put this in the newspaper that I, w I told you that my son and his family were drowned. I told you exactly where they were by that big tree at the end of the lake. And you refused to go. Uh, then I'll call the newspapers and tell them what kind of people you are. And so the, the, the fire department says, then we will go. And so they went out there 
and their hair stood up on their head. There was a car, there was a boat turned over, and they took their rakes and they, they, they pulled in and brought up five corpses. And, and everybody was amazed. They said, now, how did you do this sitting in your house? I'm sorry to have to tell you, she went to a Pentecostal church. She wanted to tell the story, and the pastor says, would you please sit down? We don't believe it, we don't accept it. And he says, furthermore, we think you're a witch. Now, now, now I came up against a full gospel woman so terrorized that her pastor had called her a witch. See, he hadn't, had no knowledge, full gospel person, and I don't want to tell you the denomination because all of you know it, and, and uh, uh, told her that she was a witch and to stop telling that stuff around the church. You cannot have the gifts of the Spirit to operate if your leaders don't know about it. All right, well, there won't be three in this city that know anything about it, you see. And you go throughout the nation, there wouldn't be one preacher in a hundred that know anything about it. You say, why? Well, you have to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. Brethren, I would not have you, you see, ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. And then we go show God how ignorant we can get about all the things we're ignorant about. Uh, and, and what can God do if you determine to be ignorant, you see? But uh, uh, we, we knew the lady, we knew how it happened, and, and she had the clippings uh, from the newspaper. Then in, I told you about how Brother Howard Carter and I, and I met. I'd had a vision of going to the mission field, and in London, uh, he had the Lord to speak to him. It wasn't a vision, saying, I have a companion prepared for you. He should come from afar, and he will be a stranger when he comes. And these are the words he will say. And I said those precise words in his ears. And, uh, uh, he didn't know hardly what to do. He said, come up to my room. And he went up there and he read that prophecy all over again. And, and then he, I didn't know what was happening. And then he said to me, God said you would come. And you're here. You said exactly the words that the Holy Ghost told me in London that you would say when you, when you arrived, you see. And, and so we have the functioning of such gifts. He went on around the world. He wouldn't wait for anybody. And I took my sister home, sold my automobile, and got me a passport, and I trailed along about two months behind him. And by the time I got to California, he'd already left the country. And I asked the Lord, I said, where is this man? And rather than telling me, I, he says, you just start at the bottom of the world and work up. Well, you have to be obedient if your mind don't know anything about it. So I got on a boat and started off for Australia. And I found him down there, but I found him in, in, in uh, New Zealand. But you see, he was praying and said, Lord, where, where is this young man? I lost him. And the Lord said, I hadn't lost him. He says, well, where is he? He says, he's down there in Wellington, New Zealand on a boat right now. He's going to be looking for you tomorrow morning. And, and says, send a note down to the Wellington pastor and tell him you'll meet him in Australia. That, that is supernatural information, you see, that... For him to know that I was on a boat down there had no way in the wide world to ever know it at all, you see, excepting that the Holy Spirit told him. Now, this man that, we live, that I lived with for a number of years was a man who had tremendous understanding of these things. God gave him these definitions and so forth, and we certainly want them to get them right straight into your heart. Uh, there's so many I'd like to tell you. Reverend Branham over here in Chicago, a man came up and he says, you didn't come for yourself. He said, no. He, he says, I came for my brother. He says, I see him right now. He says, he's in a hammock. There are pine trees all around him and he's reading a book. But you think he's sick and he is not sick. They got on the telephone and called and that man in Norway was in a hammock in the backyard reading a book and the whole congregation almost died there in Chicago. Here, here he just went in and called and what Brother Branham saw in Norway was completely right. That is the gift of the Word of God's knowledge. But what we want to in this class is not to teach you everything about it, but to stir up your desire. If we cannot stir up your desire, then we cannot do much. But if we can stir up your desire for spiritual gifts, get carnality out of our lives and out of our hearts and out of our minds, and stir up for spiritual gifts, for the supernatural to function. You have to come against all religiosity. They don't believe in it. But all through the world is history, you've had to do the same thing in every generation. If you're spiritual, the rest of the people will fight you. 
it's an amazing thing how religious people will fight religious people. And so you have to move into it almost alone. But if you want it, that's the way to move into it. But in the, in the last days, he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh. So we're now living in that time when you can certainly get more of God than ever before. Are you ready? Give the Lord a hand, everybody. <laughs> Glory. Are they exciting to you? <laughs> you almost knocked me off the platform. You're so noisy. Are they exciting to you? Yeah. Well, let's move into them then with all our hearts, Lord of mine. In our next lesson, we will be studying the third of these gifts. And so we hope that you'll be with us in the discerning of spirits. It is not the gift of discerning of devils. Too many are playing with devils. And, and uh, so the discerning of spirits means to discern what kind of spirit a person has within them. It could tremendously bless the church if this gift functioned through the church. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're good. Good to see you, everybody. Glad, glad for the blessings of the Lord upon your lives. And uh, how many had a little trouble getting here today? You didn't? The fog wasn't where you were? When I came over here, I couldn't even see the other building up in the front of the place here. I'm glad you made it. How many made it safely? Amen. How many bumped somebody? No, let's don't cry. We're so glad you're here. The Lord wonderfully bless you all day long in Jesus' name.